when you talk about the major fronts of the war in Ukraine, the Black Sea probably isn't the first thing that's going to come to mind for most people. Most attention, quite understandably, focuses on the hard attritional struggle now taking place on land. But while eyes focus on Zaporizhia or the Donbass, the war in the Black Sea is continuously changing, with potentially global implications. Ukraine, for example, appears to have struck the Kerch Strait Bridge, that vital logistical link between Russia and Crimea. And despite the bridge being ostensibly one of the most heavily defended transportation links on the planet, Russian media claims that Ukraine did so with nothing more than two jet skis modified into kamikaze drones. Then in mid-July, Russia suspended the so-called Grain Deal. That was the agreement brokered by the United Nations and Turkey that had allowed tens of millions of tonnes of Ukrainian agricultural exports to make their way onto global markets. And at time of recording, Russia had gone one step further, launching drone and missile attacks on Ukrainian grain storage, export terminals, handling facilities, and releasing statements that could be interpreted as raising the spectre of a blockade, opening the door to more active combat operations in the Black Sea. The question now, of course, is what comes next? With new weapon systems being deployed and the agricultural lifeline depended on by millions dropping away, are we about to see a new chapter in the naval war in the Black Sea? One where a new generation of sea drones and tactics will be applied to one of naval warfare's oldest problems, how to enforce or undermine a blockade. All right, so what am I going to be talking about today? First, I'll give a quick overview on the campaign in the Black Sea up to July 2023, basically asking how we got from the sinking of the Moskva to weaponized jet skis. Then I'm going to cover the big recent developments, the attack on the bridge and the breakdown of the grain deal. And that's where I really want to place the focus today, because I want to ask what the breakdown of that deal means economically, strategically, and diplomatically for the parties involved. And because it should never under any circumstances be forgotten, I want to ask what this means for people in poorer states that are highly dependent on affordable food imports or UN aid. Then we'll pivot back to more military questions, namely whether or not the Russian Navy actually has the capacity to follow through with some sort of blockade, what sort of options are now available to Ukraine and its allies, and what all of that might mean for the naval war going forward. But before we ask that somewhat frightening question, I do first need to welcome back returning long-term sponsor, Ground News. Ground News is a combination website and app that lets you compare articles from thousands of sources around the world in one place, showing you what sources are reporting, where they lean on the political spectrum, and letting you compare headlines and read articles without ever leaving the app. And since big topics like the war in Ukraine are always going to be bigger than one story, Ground News lets you focus your comparison on specific topics. For example, you could choose to follow Russia and Ukraine to create a feed that only includes those two topics. But Ground News also allows you to take it a step further and get very, very specific. We all have limited time to consume the news, and so Ground News tries to give you fine control of your news feed. For example, if I wanted a feed which only included stories on either US politics or Ukraine, I could set up something like this, save it, and it would filter accordingly. If I only want stories that cover both topics at the same time, I can do that too. And if you feel you've seen enough coverage on a particular topic, you can add those here as specific exclusions. That will let you continually refine your feed. It won't remove the political diversity of the coverage, just focus it on topics that interest you. All up, this is a fascinating way to read the news and probably worth having a look at. If you are interested, there is a link in the description that'll give you 30% off an all-access Vantage subscription. Just go to ground.news slash Perun or click the link to check it out. Okay, so as promised, in order to give some context to recent events, I wanted to start by looking at some broad developments in the Black Sea Theatre up to July of 2023. As most of you probably know, the Black Sea is very much a shared space in strategic terms. It's bordered by a number of countries, including Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, Russia, Georgia, and Turkey. And for all of them, it's a vital pathway for international trade and commerce. Even though multiple neighbours share this particular backyard, however, there is a geographical quirk. Namely, that only Turkey has the keys to the front gate. If you want to exit the Black Sea into the Mediterranean and by extension the wider world, then unless your ship is one which can successfully navigate the various river and canal systems, your best way out is going to be through the Turkish-controlled straits. It's that factor, among others, that makes Turkey so important to things like the Grain Deal. And you can bet we'll come back to discussing that particular element later on. However, while Turkey controls the best path in and out of the Black Sea, before February 2022, most observers were confident that Russia had the most powerful force within it. In the earlier stages of the full-scale invasion, it looked like the Russian Navy had ambitions to support the ground offensives and to potentially participate in a campaign to take Odessa and cut Ukraine off from the sea in its entirety. Obviously, however, that didn't happen. 
Ukrainian anti-shipping missiles, including the domestically manufactured Neptune, prove themselves to be very dangerous. Not least of which when a single salvo of the things is believed to have sunk the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva. From there, Ukraine continued to increase its stockpile of anti-shipping missiles, bringing in a number of systems from the West, including ground-launched harpoons. Now, if all Russian warships could expect their missile defense systems to respond as well in practice as they should on paper, then a handful of anti-ship missiles in a salvo probably shouldn't have been a critical threat to the principal surface combatants. But if that were the case, you could argue Moskva never should have been hit, let alone sunk. And as a result, the Russian fleet was forced to adopt a survival strategy known as staying the heck away from the Ukrainian coastline. That still left Russian warships safe to maneuver in a lot of the Black Sea wherever Ukraine's missiles couldn't reach. And they used that freedom of movement to, among other things, launch cruise missile attacks on various targets in Ukraine. Using naval launch platforms allowed Russia to launch attacks from different vectors, to use different missile systems specifically designed for naval launch, and to prove to everyone that the Black Sea Fleet was apparently doing something and was totally worth all the money that had been invested in it. With these ships launching their payloads beyond Ukraine's ability to respond with anti-ship missiles, it looks like the Ukrainians looked for other systems that would enable them to respond. And as with a significant share of the tactical problems that they have encountered over the course of this war, drones have been part of the Ukrainian answer. In particular here, we're talking about naval drones. Very small unmanned surface vessels capable of travelling to a target and then detonating against it with a large onboard warhead. Compared to something like an anti-ship missile, these things are usually going to have at least three advantages. Namely range, payload, and ease of production. Pavel and his mates probably can't build a Neptune missile in their garage. But after an appropriately stiff drink, they're probably going to be able to figure out pretty easily how to add explosives, some cameras, and a communications set to a speedboat. Ukraine has been using these kind of drones in several attacks, both against Russian ports and against Russian warships. Naval drone attacks on Sevastopol, for example, have happened several times. In late 2022, a few even got into the harbour past the initial defences. And so far as recent attacks on Russian warships go, in June, the Russian MOD claimed that one of their ships was attacked by Ukrainian naval drones, and they released an image of one of the claimed attackers with the name Cat and Raccoon written on the side. For those of you who don't know the story, when Russian troops were pulling back from Hassan, apparently they stole the raccoon from the zoo. And of all the things these Ukrainian drone builders want vengeance for, apparently it's that bloody raccoon. Now that attack wasn't successful, but the most interesting aspect of the report is that the Russians say that it took place 300 kilometers southeast of Sevastopol. Now to give you a sense of scale, that arrow on the screen there is pointing approximately 300 kilometers roughly southeast from Sevastopol, which would place the attack in the much safer, you would think, eastern half of the Black Sea, many hundreds of kilometers away from the Ukrainian coastline. What that suggests is the Ukrainians have the ISR capabilities and the range on their drones well into what should be a safe area for the Russians. And an addendum to that is just how quickly we've seen these drones evolve and how quickly their numbers have been scaled up. The fighting in Ukraine has been called a drone war, and that's no doubt true. But one of the things that I think sets this war apart from other conflicts where we've seen drones play major roles is just how quickly new designs are being iterated and deployed. Designers are often getting new equipment to the field as much in spite of the procurement process as because of it. And so design refinements appear fairly frequently. Most of these drones, however, so far have followed the same sort of basic profile. They take on a sort of speedboat type shape, they sit very low in the water, and they have a common hull shape. The version you see on the right there is the one that was advertised by U-24 for their Naval Fleet of Drones project. Reportedly, it has a range of about 800 kilometers, is 5.5 meters long, can sprint at up to 80 kilometers per hour, and carry a maximum payload of 200 kilograms of high explosive. The reported cost for this particular type of automated murder speedboat is $250,000 US dollars per, including a ground control station. That doesn't exactly make it the most expensive weapon system on the market. And that's with these things still basically being built by hand, with very few economies of scale being realized. Plus, these models almost certainly don't represent the final stage of this sort of design. The Turks, for example, have already unveiled their own version of this basic concept. And Ukraine has also started advertising an improved version of its own. The V5 reportedly further reduces the profile above the water, increases the payload to 320 kilograms, increases the range, and improves the communication suite. Plus, it's advertised as being capable of doing missions other than kamikaze attacks on targets. 
If for some unknowable reason, a potential operator wants to use this system for a mission which doesn't involve it exploding. It's important to stress here that these things are not super weapons. Military vessels have long had to deal with the threat of fast, small surface vessels like speedboats. And the vast majority of these drones are going to be intercepted before hitting their targets. But the switch to drones over manned platforms has made these things smaller, cheaper, and more disposable. Something that is likely to be terrifying to anyone responsible for defending civilian coastal infrastructure anywhere in the world. And thanks to a recent CNN report which showed one of these updated Ukrainian drone designs, we can both get a hint as to how easy it would be to further increase the lethality of these systems, but also how quickly they're already evolving. As, of course, is the way they're used. In most countries, the doctrine around the use of a system like this would be slowly and carefully developed over time, tested in exercises, iterated, and then codified. Of course, wartime isn't ordinary circumstances. And so the Ukrainians mostly seem to have adopted the learn-by-doing approach, launching these things against various targets and seeing what works. A lot of times it doesn't, and sometimes it does. Which brings us quite neatly to the attack on the Kerch Strait Bridge. For Russia, the Kerch Strait Bridge is a useful link in their logistics chain. When undamaged, the roughly 18 kilometer long bridge offers multi-lane road traffic in both directions as well as a parallel rail line. For a military that might want to move significant qualities of men and materiel into Crimea or southern Ukraine, without taking the road or rail links through the occupied territories in Zaporizhia, these bridges were always going to be a significant asset. Certainly not the only way of transporting men and equipment. Airlift, sea lift, or transport further north were always going to be options. But if you were looking for a high-profile way to weaken Russian logistics in the south of Ukraine, causing uh, traffic disruptions on this bridge would be one way to do it. The Russians clearly understood that, and defences began to appear around the bridge soon after the full-scale invasion. There was reporting on Russia setting up a multi-layered defence system, including complex air defences, radar deflectors and a variety of other mechanisms intended to keep this link safe. All of which failed to prevent the bridge being successfully attacked in late 2022, with transport across the bridge, including the vital rail connection, interrupted for many months. But the evidence suggests Russia did learn lessons from that first attack. Many new security measures were implemented, additional defences were added, all to make sure lightning did not strike twice. The Russians originally put out material advertising almost 20 elements of defence around the Kerch Strait Bridge. These included everything from air cover to patrolling naval vessels, to an air defence system that stretched from man pads and pansier systems at one extreme, to book and S-400 missiles at the other. The reported defence scheme even included trained dolphins. Because for all our advanced technology, a dolphin still might be one of the better ways to detect and deter sabotage by things like underwater divers. So next time you go swimming with the dolphins, keep in mind that Flipper's distant cousin might be in Russian military service. This sort of multi-layered defence scheme, also including things like defensive smoke screens and countermeasures, was intended to deal with threats up to and including long-range cruise missiles. And so to get through these defences, you might be forgiven for thinking Ukraine would need some sort of top-tier technology, maybe a million-dollar-plus cruise missile, something like Storm Shadow, to sneak through these capable defence systems. Or I guess they could just strap bombs to a couple of converted civilian jet skis. A piece of equipment so accessible and ubiquitous that if you wanted to equip an entire military with them, all you'd really need to do is wait till a minor economic downturn occurred and then travel to the Gold Coast or Perth, jump on Facebook Marketplace, and pick up hundreds of the bloody things slightly used for cents on the dollar. Jokes aside, there isn't much we know for sure about this second attack on the Crimean Bridge. But here at the very least is some of what's been reported so far. We know that early in the morning on the 17th of July, Russian authorities in Crimea announced that traffic on the Crimean Bridge had to be stopped due to an emergency in the area. We know that Russian media later reported that there had been an attack by two drones on the 145th support of the road bridge. We know that a civilian car had been crossing the bridge at the relevant place at the time of the detonation and there were casualties that resulted. And while I think we have to be really, really cautious about this particular claim, Russian state media did claim that the drones involved in the attack were modified jet skis. Thus, I have to assume clearing the way for manufacturers around the world to add a zero to their existing prices and start marketing their products immediately to militaries as next-generation modular multi-mission surface warfare platforms, as opposed to those things that people buy with their sign-on or enlistment bonuses, leave in the garage and never use. 
The attack appears to have inflicted some but not catastrophic damage to the bridge. Road traffic was immediately halted, but soon after resumed using one of the four available lanes. The rail bridge, meanwhile, which hadn't been directly attacked, remained in operation as before. Russian tourists heading to Crimea, because for some reason that is still a thing in the middle of a war, were instructed to divert through the occupied territories in Kherson and Zaporizhia instead, leading anecdotally to at least one incident where someone who was following their satnav just a little bit too closely had to be turned back before driving across the front line. At time of recording, Russian authorities have said that repairs to the road bridge are underway and that they should be completed by November this year. Politically speaking, the Russian response to this attack was dramatic. Putin himself described it as a terrorist act of the Kyiv regime. While one of Russia's representatives at the United Nations Security Council raised suggestions of potential Western involvement, saying, quote, We have yet to figure out to what extent Western intelligence agencies, particularly British ones, were involved in repairing and carrying out the terrorist attack. Too many things point to that. As far as I've seen, the Russians haven't elaborated on anything, in fact, that points in that direction. But that didn't stop Russian state TV airing a suggestion that a retaliatory attack should be carried out on Tower Bridge in London. And then there's Medvedev. He called for Russia to take, quote, inhumane steps, end quote, in response to the attack. In particular, he called for finding those responsible for the attacks, and they're destroying not just their homes, but those of their relatives as well. He is reported in Russian state media to have dismissed the idea of trying any of those involved as, quote, dull, end quote. Following, it seems, the well-known legal principle that the law does not apply if applying it would be boring. For those who follow this war closely and who are deeply concerned with the human tragedies playing out, there is a very serious question here, namely, how seriously should these threats of escalation be taken? On one hand, I've seen some advocate for simply ignoring Medvedev entirely. But the man is the deputy chairman of the Russian Security Council, he's the former president, he's the current leader of the United Russia Party, which would suggest you shouldn't be that quick to just write off what he says. On the other hand, he's made plenty of dramatic threats before, so often, in fact, that he's even been called out for it on Russian state TV. They recalled threats from roughly a year ago that if there were any Ukrainian attacks on Russian Crimea, then there would suddenly be a big crater where Kyiv used to be. Now attacks on Crimea are fairly regular, and Kyiv is very much still there. But if you move away from focusing on the individual and their personal credibility and record, you can instead think about this through an escalation framework, something we've talked about before. Through that logical lens, you've got two questions you need to ask. What are the options available to Russia for escalation? And would choosing to escalate put it in a better strategic position than if it chose not to? Now, different analysts might come up with different answers to that pair of questions. But in general, I think there's some very good reasons to suggest that not only is Kyiv very much still there, but that it will continue to be there basically no matter what happens to this particular bridge. And further attacks on the bridge, it should be stressed, are very much a real possibility. To be fair, there are several reasons Ukraine might be happy with the results of this particular attack. The capacity of the road was temporarily severely constrained, a lot of traffic got pushed onto alternative routes, and the cost of attacking the bridge using systems like it's claimed were used, compared to the cost of defending and repairing the bridge, are so far separated in scale that it's difficult to compare them. But, and there is a but, both the road and rail bridge remain in at least partial service repairs will be made as they were last time, and Russia will no doubt make a genuine effort to further improve the defences around it. Actually putting this bridge out of service for good would probably require sustained and very serious strikes, and only time will tell if those sort of attacks eventuate. But the role of the Black Sea over the last year has been about more than just providing a platform for Russian cruise missile launches or an arena for Ukraine to test new drones in. It's also been a vital trade conduit enabling tens of millions of tons of Ukrainian and Russian agricultural produce to make their way onto world markets. Which brings us to a discussion of the so-called grain deal, its impact over the last 12 months, and the implications of its recent demise. For context here, both Russia and Ukraine play major roles in the global food supply. Ukraine quite famously has some of the best farmland in the world. And before the full-scale invasion, Russia and Ukraine combined accounted for about 12% of all calories that make it onto the global market. The figures for specific crops were even more dramatic. Ukraine, for example, accounted for about half of all global sunflower oil exports, 
And between 2018 and 2020, it's reported that about 44% of all African wheat imports came from either Russia or Ukraine. Now, as you can imagine, food is not a particularly discretionary good. We're talking about grains here, not new cars, cosmetics and gaming consoles. And of all the things people are likely to stop buying when prices go up, basic foodstuffs are down the bottom of the list. And so if a significant supply is ever suddenly taken off the market, it's logical that prices will respond. That thesis was proven true in early 2022 when Russia launched its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, and suddenly it did look like a lot of agricultural exports were suddenly going to be taken off the market. I've got a chart there for the price of wheat over time. As you can see, prices were already experiencing significant inflation before 2022. Then you hit February 2022 and the line basically goes vertical. That spike was potentially very dangerous for countries that were highly dependent on these sort of imports. And so in July of 2022, an agreement was reached. Actually, to be technical about it, two agreements were reached. One between the UN, Turkey and Ukraine, and one between the UN, Turkey and Russia. The basic goal of which was to start getting this agricultural production back onto the global market and to bring prices down. With regards to Ukrainian exports, the process basically went like this. Ships would first be inspected in Turkey to make sure they weren't carrying any military cargo to Ukraine, for example. There have been some claims that Russia used that inspection process to somewhat control the flow of grain, delaying or slowing down inspections whenever they wanted the flow to slow. But through most of the grain deal's life, ships were getting through that inspection process. Then they would follow specified routes to Ukraine, load up on agricultural exports, and carry those back out to the global market again along pre-agreed routes. For Ukraine, the deal had some pretty significant drawbacks. By agreeing to have incoming ships searched, it was essentially cutting itself off from any possibility of transporting militarily useful goods by sea. But it did give it a mechanism to get its agricultural exports out and into the world market. And as the cargoes began to move, prices came down accordingly. And over the course of the next year or so, more than 30 million tonnes of agricultural products would be exported under this arrangement. But ultimately, it looks like it wasn't to last. A number of times over the course of the grain deal's life, Russia made noises about not continuing with the plan, withdrawing or not renewing it every time it came up for renewal. On each occasion prior to July 2023, the response was usually some combination of Turkey and the international community applying pressure and Russia eventually agreeing to go along with the deal for a little bit longer. But almost all the while, Russia claimed it wasn't getting a fair deal under the agreement and it made a number of demands in exchange for its continued participation. Among those demands were the reactivation of an ammonia export pipeline through Ukraine for Russian ammonia exports, something which became essentially impossible after the pipeline was damaged in June, with the Russians claiming the damage was caused by a Ukrainian sabotage group and the Ukrainians claiming the pipeline was hit by Russian shelling. Notably, the Russians also demanded that one of their state-owned banks be reconnected to the SWIFT international payment system. Ostensibly, they argued because not being connected to SWIFT made it difficult for Russia to receive payment for its agricultural exports. For context, there are two points that I want to add here. Firstly, Russian grain exports are widely projected to hit record levels in 2023. So it would appear they currently have a way to get the goods out and to get paid for them. The second thing to note is that Russia was offered a compromise solution, one where payments for Russian agricultural exports could be made to a third-party bank still connected to the SWIFT system, those funds would then be forwarded through a specially created connection to the Russian bank. So in this scenario, a buyer could pay using SWIFT, the Russians would receive their money swiftly. Meanwhile, the sanctioning countries wouldn't have to worry about Russia using its newly reconnected state-owned bank to potentially exploit its newly reconnected status to handle payments not at all related to the agriculture sector. That proposed compromise appears to have been rejected. It's also worth noting that the grain deal was deeply unpopular with some groups within Russia. Many pro-war voices, for example, seem to be vehemently against it. And there was no doubt internal political pressure for Russia to walk away, which they ultimately did on the 17th of July, 2023. The deal came up for renewal, and no renewal was forthcoming. But that's not where this story ends. Because having withdrawn from an agreement which gave it some control over what Ukraine could import and export, Russia suddenly had a problem. Namely, that there was now suddenly no legal barrier to Ukraine continuing to trade on the Black Sea anyway. As surprising as it may be, there is no legal requirement in a war that you ask permission from your opponent before you try and export goods onto the global market or bring supplies in from abroad. 
So if Russia wanted to prevent Ukraine trading on the Black Sea, it would have to find a military mechanism to do so. And so one of the first steps Russia has taken after withdrawing from the grain deal appears to have been to launch a new strategic bombing campaign. This time not targeting Ukraine's power infrastructure, but instead its ability to store and export its agricultural produce. Ukraine currently has millions of tonnes of foodstuffs in storage. The winter barley harvest in places like Odessa only started last month. And so the country desperately needs places to store its production and ways to export it. Russia recently has targeted both. We've seen attacks on export terminals in cities like Odessa and Mykolaiv, and through attacks that have reportedly used systems ranging from Shahed drones all the way up to top-of-the-line cruise missiles, the Russians have also scored direct hits on a number of grain storage facilities. In Mykolaiv, for example, the Ukrainians have claimed that about 60,000 tonnes of grain was destroyed in one strike. It was also, the Ukrainians claim, meant to go to the People's Republic of China. Now, it is theoretically possible that all of these hits are errors, mistakes and coincidences. But the suspicious timing, the sudden surge in these targets being hit, the deployment of precision weapons, and the fact these targets are being hit in multiple locations at roughly the same time, even very close to the border with NATO, would all seem to suggest that Russia is doing this deliberately. That it is choosing to invest some of its limited supply of long-range precision weapons, attacking Ukraine's ability to ship food to the world. When making these videos, I try to be measured in my analysis, if not my tone. But here I have to add a personal reflection. I would deeply like to know what possible legitimate military reason there is for launching precision strikes against food supplies intended to feed people outside the borders of the country you are invading. To me, that's not a chess move, it's a dick move. And based on recent Russian announcements, it may not just be food supplies within Ukraine itself that are potentially at risk. Because soon after Russia withdrew from the grain deal, we saw statements from the Ministry of Defense that seemed to suggest that not only would Russia be striking targets within Ukraine, it might also impose a blockade on ships trying to go to Ukrainian ports. Those statements, repeated on Russian state media, included a suggestion that Russia would regard all ships going to Ukrainian ports across the Black Sea as potential carriers of military cargo, and that Russia would consider the flag states of such ships to be viewed as participating in the Ukrainian conflict on the side of Kyiv. By itself, those statements were relatively vague. With regards to ships travelling towards Ukrainian ports, that statement could mean basically anything, from Russia committing to send a strongly worded letter to the embassy of any nation that sent its ships towards Ukraine, to Russia deciding to check incoming ships for military cargo by firing at them and seeing if that triggered secondary explosions. On the 21st, Russia appeared to clarify those initial statements. When the deputy foreign minister came out and clarified that what Russia meant was inspecting ships to check if they were carrying military cargo, saying, quote, What is meant there is that we must make sure of this. We must check if a ship is carrying something bad. Now, that sounds awfully like a type of blockade, which, if true, immediately raises a bunch of questions with significant implications for the way the Black Sea campaign proceeds. Questions like whether this was legal and how Russia could actually go about stopping ships heading to Ukraine and searching them. Because there, as is often the case, the devil is in the detail. It's one thing to say you would like to stop and search ships heading towards a country, but unless your opponent bought all their shipping engines from Wish.com, wishes don't stop ships. And so I want to quickly look at some of the options Russia might have if it does choose to impose a blockade. Now, one option might be something called a close blockade. In this scenario, what you do is you set your navy up relatively close to your opponent's ports and then notify incoming ships that they will be stopped and searched. To do that legally, a number of barriers have to be overcome. For one, you need to publicly declare the blockade and its terms. What area does it cover, over what time, what cargoes are you prohibiting, etc. If you just whisper the words, I blockade the target under your breath and then start boarding ships, that's not a legal blockade, that's piracy. There are also other requirements that are notable. For example, in order for a ship to actually have to stop because of a blockade, you have to be enforcing that blockade. If you don't have ships there, neutral shipping is not required to stop. This prevents, for example, North Korea declaring a blockade of the United States, and in so doing, preventing all neutral shipping from being able to legally reach American ports. If you want to blockade the US, you have to go and blockade the US. 
which, given the US Navy's likely opinion on the matter, would certainly be a uh, bold move. This is where close blockades can be quite useful. If you set up relatively close to the ports you're blockading, you might not need that large of a force. You might not need that many ships to cover the approaches. The problem somewhere like Ukraine is that this sort of approach would likely be complete suicide. Because here you're talking about having naval vessels sit relatively close to the Ukrainian coastline, blockading their ports, which is basically the best possible scenario for every anti-ship missile crew on the Ukrainian coastline. Another option might be to set up something like a standoff blockade. Here you set up your blockade line much further away from the Ukrainian coastline, out of range of anti-ship missiles, for example. At these distances, you might still be exposed to naval drones, for example, but you might be out of range of at least the missile threat. The problem here is that you now have more ocean to cover, which means you need more ships to actually enforce your blockade. That might be a problem given the relatively limited size of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. But let's just say the Russians are able to pull this off. Let's just say the Russians are able to set up a legal standoff blockade to search ships for military cargoes heading towards Ukraine. There is still at least one big question I have about this potential plan. Namely, it allows you to search ships for military cargoes. So what on earth do you do if it is actually just carrying food? Agricultural products are not military cargoes. And so if you pull out of the grain deal in order to establish a blockade which only aims to prevent military goods getting to Ukraine, then you've gone from a situation where the grain can move but military cargo can't because of inspections that take place in Turkey without any risk to your navy, to a situation where the grain can still legally pass but now you have to risk your navy in order to prevent military cargoes moving through the Black Sea. That doesn't sound like a particularly good prospect from an economy of force perspective. But if you want to actually physically stop grain-carrying ships without risking your warships, you probably don't have a lot of very good options. I mean, it is technically possible for Russia to begin sinking ships without warning that might be travelling towards Ukraine. They do have that military capability. There are a number of submarines in the Black Sea Fleet, and they have access to long-range anti-ship missiles. But from a legal, political, and diplomatic perspective, it's hard to imagine this idea being practical. You're talking about potentially sinking ships belonging to neutral nations or within the territorial waters of other states. That may have been the done thing during World War II, unrestricted submarine warfare. But in 2023, I would desperately hope this is a non-starter. In some ways, a far more dangerous potential option would be to apply some of the principles of grey zone or hybrid warfare. The US, for example, has suggested that Russia might be laying mines in the path of potential grain-carrying ships. And on Russian channels, you can find open discussion of the idea of using submarines to lay mines in the path of ships, and then just blame the Ukrainians when the ship is blown up by saying it was a Ukrainian mine. Now, in theory, it might be possible for nations to thoroughly rebut that sort of argument. Ukraine doesn't currently have any submarine mine layers of its own, and the combination of drones, satellites, and other assets means that surface ships are being tracked most of the time. But mines that are laid, either covertly or overtly, might still pose a very significant risk to ships trying to move through these corridors. And even if no ship ever actually hits a mine, it can still pose a significant problem, something we'll come back to in a moment. Because the key point I wanted to make here is that in the absence of the grain deal, the Black Sea resembles a lot more a traditional war zone. One where your ability to impose your will on the enemy is more determined by the strength of your fleet as opposed to any existing agreement and one where it is legitimate for your opponent to try and evade you or to strike back. So if there is no return to the grain deal, and we do see the move towards some sort of Russian blockade, firstly, whether Russia has the capacity to effectively impose a legal conventional blockade, secondly, if not, whether Russia might be tempted to harass or attack ships in some sort of other way, and thirdly, if they did so, how might Ukraine and other powers respond? Because if you look at the vessel finder map I have there on the right of the screen there, you'll see part of the Russian problem. At the moment, there is very little traffic heading towards Ukrainian ports. But trade out of and into Russian ports is still running very brisk business. Now, under ordinary circumstances, that's fine. Ukraine doesn't really have an active surface navy at this point. It can't possibly impose any sort of legal stop-and-search blockade scheme if for no other reason than the fact a naval drone is going to have a hard time searching a ship's cargo hold. But if the rules ever did get thrown out the window, that's a lot of vulnerable shipping. And while a warship might be able to easily deal with something like a speedboat kamikaze drone, for example, using its mounted guns, Russian-flagged merchant ships probably aren't going to be packing multiple close-in weapon systems. 
Now, obviously, unless Russia escalates first, there's no reason for Ukraine to take that sort of step. The diplomatic and political fallout would probably be massive. And so, for the moment at least, I think the most likely scenario is neither side choosing to attack merchant shipping. But critically for Ukraine and many other countries around the world, just because Russia might struggle to impose a tight blockade of Ukrainian ports, that doesn't mean they might not be successful in keeping Ukrainian grain from entering the world market. Because at the end of the day, you do not need to physically stop a ship if it never sets sail in the first place. And if you're Russia, there's a lot of things you can do to make it unlikely that that ever happens. A ship can't load or unload without port infrastructure, for example. So you could try to blow some of that up, as Russia already has. Or you could just try to make the idea of sailing to Ukrainian ports sound so risky that no one will insure a ship to do it. That's a critical point because in the 21st century, you'll really struggle to find a merchant ship that will set sail without proper insurance cover. And so far, at least, it looks an awful lot like the insurance companies are looking at this scenario, the risk of something going wrong to a vessel traveling the Black Sea, and that they really don't want to take the risk of Russia potentially doing something extreme. Remember, Russia didn't impose a blockade at the start of its full-scale invasion either, and yet shipping slowed dramatically. Because ultimately, and I know this will come as a shock to absolutely everyone listening, but insurance companies are not charities and are not in the business of extending cover just because it would be a nice thing to do. And without insurance, most shipping companies are not going to risk a ship that might be worth tens of millions of dollars, its crew, and a cargo that again might be worth tens of millions more. So while the prospects of an effective Russian blockade may be very mixed, while it's possible there may be all sorts of diplomatic developments in the coming days and weeks, it certainly seems possible that even without any dramatic measures, Russia might succeed in severely constraining Ukrainian exports through the Black Sea, which means it's time to pivot to a bit of economics and ask what that interruption might mean for the market and the world. And I want to start that discussion by focusing on some of the messaging around the cancellation of the grain deal. Namely, that one of the reasons the Russians gave for extending it, I've got a quote there from Russian state media on the screen, is that they claimed the deal was primarily sending grain towards developed Western countries rather than poorer states. Russia said that was a breach of the agreement's primary purpose to benefit less wealthy countries. Firstly, that statement just doesn't hold up. According to the UN's Joint Coordination Centre, 57% of all of Ukraine's exports under the deal went to developing countries, with the greatest recipient actually being the People's Republic of China. Furthermore, Ukraine directly supplied 725,000 tonnes of grain to the World Food Programme. That grain helped provide humanitarian aid in Afghanistan, Djibouti, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. Now, the human brain struggles at scales like thousands of tons. So let me try for a moment to put that into a human perspective. Back in August of 2022, a ship, the MV Carteria, left a Ukrainian port carrying 37,000 tons of wheat grain. The ship stopped in Turkey, where the grain was milled into flour, and then it travelled on to Yemen, where at the time 17 million people were struggling with acute hunger. According to the World Food Programme, that one vessel carried enough food to provide emergency food assistance to 4 million people. As of July 2023, the World Food Programme was procuring 80% of all of its wheat grain from Ukraine via this initiative. But even if none of that was true, focusing on the recipients ignores the fact that things like grains are commodities, freely traded, low-friction goods, and that often what matters isn't where any individual shipment goes, it's what the impact in overall prices are. Initially, some Russian media ran articles suggesting that Russia leaving the grain deal wouldn't drive up food prices because Russia was supplying so much that it would cover the gap. Cut to about a week later and they were instead carrying IMF projections of a 10 to 15% increase in grain prices. Because in the end, global prices are largely driven by aggregate supply and demand, not individual shipment locations. If you withdraw supply from the market, then there'll be upward pressure on prices. If you add supply, there will be downward pressure. And so even if 100% of all of Ukraine's agricultural exports under the grain deal had been going to the European Union, ending the deal would still have an impact on those at the poorer end of the market. Because if you stop supplying the European Union and the EU still wants grain, it's going to go elsewhere on the market, find another supplier and buy up that supply. If that leaves the overall market in a state of shortage, then the person who is losing out the most is the person with the least ability to pay at the bottom of the totem pole, 
because it's going to be really hard for them to outbid developed economies trying to buy foodstuffs. This is literally what we saw during the energy war in 2022. When supplies of Russian gas to countries like Germany began to slow down, Germany responded by buying additional LNG on the global market. Because Germany still very much wanted the gas, and whenever Germany writes checks, they always clear. So you could argue the countries that found it hardest to actually get cargoes in that environment were those with less ability to pay. Think about countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka. So to the extent that the end of the grain deal takes any Ukrainian supply out of the global market, there is almost always going to be a potential impact on vulnerable importers. Now, the total upward movement that you observe in those prices may not be the same as it otherwise would be, because yes, particularly when you're talking about things like wheat, we have seen an uptick over the last few years in exports from certain other countries. Russia, for example, did have a very good year, and Australian exports have also spiked significantly from the drought years a little while ago. Australia is generally pretty good at growing things as long as it decides to rain, but not so much at all floods away. But even if you do see other global increases in exports of certain commodities like wheat, it's a tremendously big ask to cover for the loss potentially of all Ukrainian agricultural exports across all categories. And the situation may get significantly worse if the threat extends from Ukrainian exports to Ukrainian production. Now, by reputation, most farmers are pretty hardy people. Add some Slavic culture and you're looking at people who will go out and try and do their job despite basically any interruption short of a nuclear apocalypse. Farmers in Ukraine since the full-scale invasion have had to deal with all sorts of additional threats. Strained supply lines, difficulty exporting their products, landmines and unexploded ordnance in their fields, the list goes on. Many have tried to just make do. There's an image there of a farmer who rigged up a tractor to clear mines from his field. And I swear, if you showed that image to my grandpa, he would not be horrified at the concept, but instead immediately moved to trying to make upgrades to the thing. But being tough and being able to work economic miracles are not the same thing. And with increased transportation and production costs all eating into things, the margins for Ukrainian farmers are going to be tight or negative in many cases. And while some farmers might be able to make a buck salvaging the occasional air defense system, Overall, wartime is a hard environment, and agricultural production in Ukraine is down by something like 40%, reportedly. If too much of this production capacity turns off, if too many farmers go bust or too many fields remain fallow for too long, then you're not going to be able to just turn this capacity back on when conditions improve. Under those conditions, it would take time and money to get Ukrainian production back up to where it started. And in a world where, pre-February 2022, perhaps 400 million people worldwide relied on Ukrainian exports, those might be some painful years. So if that's the general picture, where does that leave the individual players involved? What does this mean in the near term for Russia, Ukraine, and for food importers? Arguably for Russia, there's a short-term positive economic impact, in no small part because Russia is a major food exporter, and so if the price of food goes up, Russian export earnings go with it. The president of the Russian Grain Union, for example, is already reported to have said that Russian farmers will benefit from higher prices as a result of Russia pulling out of the deal. What's harder to assess are any countervailing economic costs. Putin, for example, has announced that Russia intends to provide some free grain to poor countries to compensate for the loss of the Ukrainian export deal. How expensive that program ends up being depends a lot on how much grain is provided under it. So far, the announcements have been in the tens of thousands of tons range for a small selection of countries. But if the aim is to compensate for all the impact of losing tens of millions of tons of Ukrainian exports, then you'd have to expect that that bill will increase. Then in military terms, I think there's a strong argument to suggest that the loss of the grain deal is actually a net loss for the Russian military. Ukraine will no longer have to voluntarily submit to having naval traffic searched in Turkey. Instead, if Russia wants to regulate that traffic, it's going to have to deploy its own resources and do it itself. We'll come back to what that might mean for the Black Sea campaign a little later on. But right now, I want to focus on the diplomatic and the political costs. Because this is a deal that was pretty universally popular outside Russia. It helped keep food prices down, control inflation, and so walking away from it hasn't been particularly well received. To illustrate this point, I looked at the meeting notes that came out of a meeting of the UN Security Council on 21st July in relation to Russia's withdrawal from the grain deal and the attacks on Ukrainian port infrastructure. Because this is the UN Security Council, there are only going to be 15 members at any given time, but it still provides an interesting sample of countries to look at. 
And to put it pretty bluntly, other than Russia itself, no one was really a fan. Brazil expressed great concern over attacks on facilities on the Black Sea coast and stressed that the destruction of civilian infrastructure is against international law and should not be used as a tool. They also urged restraint from any actions that impeded the flow of food or fertilizers. The UAE expressed regret the deal hadn't been extended and called for a peace that respected Ukraine's sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity. Ecuador deplored the suspension and stated that any attack on civil vessels would be unacceptable. And ostensibly neutral Switzerland condemned the attacks on Odessa and other ports. But if you're a Russian diplomat in 2023, you don't expect everyone to say nice things about you all the time. What's more concerning is when countries that are sometimes viewed as being more sympathetic towards your cause start subtly or not so subtly questioning your decisions. Gabon and Mozambique are both states that have previously abstained from condemning Russia's invasion in the General Assembly. But both expressed concern over the socioeconomic impact of the suspension. And Gabon would ask the Secretary General to continue attempts to break the deadlock and get the deal re-established. At time of recording, the African Union has now also come out and called on Russia to resume the grain deal. So while Putin might claim the deal wasn't really about Africa and didn't mean much to Africa, the actual nations in Africa seem to disagree. Some individual states might call for further concessions to Russia in relation to its ammonia exports, for example, but no one seems at all interested in cutting Ukraine off from the market. And then finally, there was the People's Republic of China. And the records from this meeting state that the Chinese representatives said the deal should be implemented in a balanced, comprehensive and effective manner. They also call for peace talks, saying that sovereignty and territorial integrity should be safeguarded, and that the reasonable security concerns of all parties should be taken seriously. Compared to many of the other statements, it's a very balanced one. The reference to security interests could be interpreted as a nod to Russia, as could the call for a balanced implementation of the grain deal. But on the deal as a whole, the Chinese diplomats are pretty clear. As a major food importing nation, they want Ukrainian product to flow. Outside the UNSC context, I also think we have to talk about the implications for Russia's relationship with Turkey. I'll talk about that relationship more in the future, but suffice to say, it's a complicated one. Since February 2022, Turkey has been a growing trade partner for Russia and hasn't imposed anywhere near as many sanctions on Russia as the EU has. That's made the relationship with Turkey a significant and important one for the Russian Federation. But Turkish weapons have also flowed to the Ukrainian military and Turkey was arguably the major architect of the original grain agreement. And every time it came close to collapse, it was one of the major sources of pressure to keep it going. And this time again, the Turks displayed how publicly invested they were. Just a few days before Russia pulled out of the agreement, Erdogan publicly stated that he believed he and Putin were on the same page when it came to renewing the agreement, forcing the Kremlin to have to come out publicly and clarify that no agreement to extend the deal had been made. By walking away from the deal, Russia will likely have put yet more stress on this particular relationship. Now, in the end, none of this means Russia has to immediately change course. But the battle for international opinion is absolutely a part of the wider war for Ukraine. Hearts and minds ultimately can drive and influence policy. And if you want to influence someone's heart or mind, you could argue their stomach and their wallet are two very good places to start. And by withdrawing from this agreement and then immediately attacking Ukrainian export infrastructure, for a lot of people around the world, it might look like Russia is going after both. But that diplomatic blowback for Russia doesn't immediately make things easier for Ukraine. There, this will probably cause further damage to an already suffering agricultural sector. It'll make it even harder to maintain momentum for that critical part of the national economy. But that's very unlikely to translate into any threat to the financial stability of the Ukrainian government. As long as Ukraine is receiving sufficient support from its allies and backers, then it will be able to carry on. You can suggest the people most likely to feel the effects of this are going to be Ukrainian producers and consumers of Ukrainian products, not the Ukrainian government or war effort. Meanwhile, militarily, this event might actually give Ukraine a little bit more freedom of action. It could try, for example, to take better advantage of the Black Sea to move things other than agricultural products. But how practical that is, is going to depend on a range of factors. The impact on vulnerable importers is far easier to predict. This change is going to put upward pressure on prices and thus the cost of living. The only thing that really remains to be determined is how much upward pressure. However much Ukrainian product gets out in the absence of this deal, 
It's likely to be lesser in quantity and more expensive in cost than it otherwise would have been. That means whatever the price of these products on the global market, whether they go up or down, all else being equal in any scenario, the price will be higher than it would be in a world where this deal continued. And that's before we get into all the cheery specifics, like where the World Food Program is going to make up for the grain it was getting from Ukraine. My core point here is that the market will adapt as best as it can. Food will flow from where it's available and organisations will do their best to mitigate the impact on global hunger. But almost whatever the final outcome is, all else being equal, it will be a worse outcome for potentially millions of people than a world in which those supplies continued to flow. Which brings us to how Ukraine and its allies may choose to respond. Blockades are ancient military problems. And so while we can't go through all the potential response options, we can illustrate a few broad ones. The first is to try and move Ukraine's export products without going through the Black Sea. In some ways, the world is lucky that the end of the grain deal is happening now as opposed to in late 2022. Because perhaps on the understanding that Russia might not stick with the deal forever, a lot of work has been done over the last year preparing for this sort of contingency. Ukraine can't just sell all of its product in neighbouring markets. Many of those have producers of their own that they need to protect, and as a result, a number of EU countries have implemented import bans on a number of Ukrainian products. But while they won't allow them to be sold in countries like Poland, for example, they absolutely will allow them to transit through to try and get to other destinations. The biggest single alternative route for Ukrainian grain is the so-called Danube route through Romania. The Romanian port of Constanta handled 15.25 million tonnes of grain in the first half of 2023. That was an increase of 25% on the same period in 2022. Of that 15.25 million, about half, 7.5 million tonnes, was Ukrainian grain specifically. That was up from 8.6 million tonnes in the entirety of 2022. At that rate, you could expect to move 15 million tonnes of Ukrainian product through that port in Romania over the course of this year. That's significant, but you need to keep it in perspective. Compared to the more than 30 million tonnes that were shipped through the Black Sea, it's a lot, but not enough. Supporting the Romanian option are a number of other combined road, rail and riverine options. Croatia, for example, has offered to help move grain by rail to ports on the Adriatic. The Baltic states have made similar offers about ports on the Baltic. And given the urgency of the situation, you should expect to see all sorts of interesting logistical workarounds. Efforts to move grain long distances through the river systems, for example, will probably intensify in a significant way. The problems here are both capacity and efficiency. In terms of capacity, it may just not be physically possible to move all the product that needs to be moved. And even when product does reach a final consumer, the costs of getting it there are just going to be higher. Because of all the transportation methods that humans have yet devised, for bulk cargoes, absolutely nothing beats just putting it on a giant ship and floating it to its destination. Alternative routes can help take the edge off, but in the end, there's no replacing the Black Sea. Another option might be trying to ship the grain over the Black Sea, even though there's no grain deal in place. The deal didn't make exports from Ukraine legal, it just made them safer. And indeed, back in November of 2022, when Putin said Russia might pull out of the grain agreement in the future, he still indicated that if they did, they wouldn't interdict grain shipments from Ukraine to Turkey. Time will tell if that particular undertaking is quietly forgotten. But realistically, in the absence of a deal, you'd need at least two somewhat special things. Firstly, you'd need to find a ship and a crew willing to make the journey. Critically, it cannot be a Ukrainian flagged ship, because whereas a neutral ship might only be stopped and searched, a Ukrainian ship could potentially be taken as a prize of war. So you need a ship and crew from a neutral nation with somewhere between zero and no shits to give. Then you need to find insurance for that ship. If the private sector isn't willing to do so, that means a government might have to step in and do it for them. Back in February, for example, Ukraine set up a 543 million US dollar fund to compensate civilian ships for any damage they suffered entering or exiting Ukrainian ports. In this sort of scenario, that kind of scheme would have to be extended to cover the entire transport route. And then with a ship, crew and insurance, the plan would simply be to sail as normal, gambling that Russia is unlikely to sink an unarmed neutral ship clearly carrying a non-military cargo. If you wanted a greater deterrence factor, however, you could step things up a notch. In the late 1980s, the Iranians purported to close the Straits of Hormuz, 
In doing so, they potentially cut the world off from an awful lot of hydrocarbon exports from the Middle East. There was tremendous concern, probably not unfounded, that if Kuwaiti oil tankers tried to make the trip, then the Iranians might potentially attack them. And so the Kuwaiti oil tankers were reflagged as American ones. And with that quick rebranding exercise, any attack against them would become a potential act of war against the United States. This is essentially the naval diplomatic equivalent of saying, come at me, bro. Of course, that's only half the story of Operation Earnest Will. The other is that the ships were also grouped up into convoy and placed under military escort, implying that the find-out stage following any attack on an American ship would be moved to potentially within minutes of any attack being made. In the context of the Black Sea, a military escort would be a dramatic escalation. And in terms of countries that could practically do it, there's really only one that comes to mind. Namely, the original sponsor of the grain deal and major Black Sea power, Turkey. It won't be long before I talk about Turkey in its own right. But for now, it's enough to know that Turkey is a major power in the Black Sea that actually outnumbers the Russians in terms of hulls in the water. The Turkish fleet has 16 frigates of various types, 45 patrol and coastal combatants, and 12 diesel-electric submarines. Add to that both a significant air force and air defense system, which ironically enough includes at least one Russian S-400 air defense system, and you have a force with enough vessels that it could, hypothetically at least, provide escorts for shipments. But here I want to tamp down expectations if there are any. Placing ships under military escort would be a significant change in this war. Turkey is a member of NATO, and any confrontation between Turkish and Russian ships would be a confrontation between NATO and Russian ships. And that's before you take account of the fact that Turkish-Russian relations are squarely in the it's complicated category. It would be a pretty dramatic line in the sand to dare Russia to cross. The consequences of them doing so would be potentially crushing. But if you're looking for the most likely potential outcomes, on the available evidence, I suspect the parties involved will try just about any less extreme option first before attempting anything quite this dramatic. So where does all that leave the Black Sea Theatre looking forward? So far as the grain deal itself goes, there'll obviously be massive international pressure to put it back in place. But while a lot of countries probably want to see this deal reinstated, there's also something of a strategic dilemma here. Russia left the deal because it wanted to gain concessions. But if it is given concessions, then that might be interpreted as rewarding a country for actively interdicting or threatening food shipments and bombing grain infrastructure. That's not a precedent many countries are going to want to set. So a renewed deal is definitely a possibility, but there are a lot of unknowns out there over how one would be negotiated. And if there is no follow-on deal, the question becomes, what has Russia gotten out of this? Inflicting some economic damage on Ukraine in exchange for giving them back autonomy in the Black Sea and paying a significant tax in international opinion. And in the absence of a deal, we'll probably see the Black Sea looking more and more like a traditional theatre of war. Without Ukraine being bound by any legal restrictions, if Russia is going to want to control Ukrainian shipping, or rather international shipping to and from Ukraine, well, logically, it's going to have to enforce its will the hard way. That might mean trying to impose a blockade, it might mean trying to scare off the insurance firms, or it might mean diverting expensive long-range precision weapons to target port infrastructure as opposed to military targets. And for their part, Ukraine will gain a motivation to try and open those shipping routes to do things like attack Russian ships that are trying to enforce any blockade, and build confidence in its ability to protect ships as they enter and exit Ukrainian ports. In many of these scenarios, what you expect to see is an uptick in military action on the Black Sea, one that may involve familiar weapons like maritime drones, but also potentially other weapon systems as well, as Ukraine finally begins to receive things like Western aircraft, for example, and with them, potentially gains the ability to launch things like Western air-launched anti-ship missiles. The combination of the Russian fleet potentially being given a new mission which requires it to leave port, at the same time as Ukraine gains longer-ranged anti-ship capabilities, certainly makes for an interesting hypothetical scenario. Only time will tell how it goes on to evolve. In conclusion, the Black Sea Theatre existed in a sort of strategic stalemate over the course of much of 2022 and early 2023. Both Russia and Ukraine mostly engage each other from standoff distances, Russia using cruise missiles and Ukraine using long-range strike drones, with the attack on the Crimean Bridge demonstrating just how dangerous those drones are becoming. All the while, merchant traffic to Ukraine and Russia was protected and regulated by the Grain Agreement, an agreement that now seems to have ended. 
The end to that agreement is going to place upward pressure on global food prices while also setting the scene for a potential blockade and counter-blockade campaign in the Black Sea. Because unless Russia can find a way to prevent naval traffic heading to Ukrainian ports, then it's unlikely to see much benefit from walking away from the agreement. Both sides now appear to have a set of imperfect options available to them. For Russia, the risks and limitations of any potential blockade are obvious. While for Ukraine, there are no easy options to make up for the shipping capacity that was protected under the agreement. But in the absence of a deal, both sides will now have a greater incentive to fight for sea control in the Black Sea. A campaign which may see the employment of new weapons, new tactics, and also potentially shape the outcomes for millions of people in vulnerable food importing countries around the world. Okay, and here's the channel update to close out. Firstly, I am back in a reasonable recording environment today, so I hope everything sounded better. That obviously won't last, it never does, but thank you for putting up with the interesting experience that was last week's video. It got so bad at one point that I fell back on the low-tech solution of putting a blanket over my head while recording, but you know, when you're moving around, you gotta do what you gotta do. I do hope you all enjoyed today's video. I've been looking for an opportunity to talk about the Black Sea, but I wanted to talk about multiple topics at the same time unmanned naval drones, the Crimean Bridge, the Grain Deal, I think all of these things are interrelated. And it was only when Russia finally announced they were pulling out of the Grain Agreement that I thought the time had arrived to complete this video and get it ready for release. Doing this video also reminded me that I really need to do a video on Turkey at some point, its defense sector, its strategy, and its role in the war in Ukraine. So no promises when that one will arrive, but it will arrive. A quick final note for patrons, I recently threw up a post that was just a little behind the scenes on how I use satellite imagery to track hardware depletion. It's nothing extreme, but I am looking for more opportunities to share these little glimpses behind the curtains, these little behind the scenes looks going forward, just as a way to say thank you for your support. I also, of course, have to say thank you to Ground News for their very long-running support of the channel. And of course, just to all of you who continue to watch week after week and engage and contribute. I have to have one of the best communities and comment sections on the internet, and I have each and every one of you to thank for it. So please take that as a big thank you from me, and I'll see you all again next week.